And the other thing that becomes a big driver is the core materials, the foam. This stuff weighs nothing. It's feather light. But if you have 260 square feet of this stuff in your wing skins, it starts to add up. Um, and I found that one of the big weight drivers is literally the wing skins. When I started this design, I thought the entire wing would be of molded uh, sandwich panel construction, like this, where there's a composite skin on one side, uh, some foam in between, and composite on the other side. And I'd mold this, and I'd hand me a super slick, high-performance flying wing. And as I built samples, made samples, and tested them, and weighed them, uh, and did all of that work, I discovered that's a tough nut to crack. Because even using manufacturing methods for these parts that minimizes the amount of resin used, I could not get the weights down into an acceptable range. Uh, and I found out a big driver, and I wrote it down here. For every ounce per square foot of wing, and I forgot to write that in here, for every one ounce per square foot of wing, for my wing, that adds eight and three quarter pounds of weight. So if I have a particular structural method for these skins uh, that takes an ounce more than another method, holy cow, I just added eight and a half, eight and three quarter pounds to my wing. Eight and three quarter pounds out of a hundred. Eight and three quarter percent. And that's the penalty for adding an ounce per square foot. So, big driver. How do you get the weight down? Well, you can't use sandwich panel for the whole darn wing and hit 100 pounds. Ain't going to happen. You could actually hit the numbers, depending upon how you design. The carbon fiber is plenty strong enough on the inside. You don't need 5.6 ounce. You can work with 4 ounce and 2 ounce and get that down. And you can put like 1 ounce or 1 and a half ounce fiberglass on the outside and get down in that weight range where you could have the entire aircraft be a composite skin and have a 15 meter span, 130 square foot wing, 140 square foot wing that weighed 100 pounds, give or take a few. However, you then run into durability problem. The skins get so thin, they're susceptible to dents. If you, if you were to whack them, you literally dent them, quite easy. Uh, push hard enough from the outside, You'd cripple a skin, cause local buckling, and break it that way. It becomes a handling nightmare. Uh, essentially, what you end up building is a flying eggshell. Uh, that is structurally plenty strong enough, as long as you don't ever push on it <laughs> and cause it to buckle. Uh, and if you always wrap it up in a blanket or some foam pads before you put it away, make sure you got a nice foam pad on the ground before you set it down, because if there's a sharp rock, it's going to go right through the skin. It becomes uh, an aircraft that has high maintenance and low utility. And uh, I didn't want to go down that route. So my particular design has a combination of sandwich panel skins. The D-tubes are all sandwich panel. And after the D-tubes, some of it's sandwich panel construction and some of it's fabric. Uh, the fabric is outboard. Fabric's kind of handy because you can set it down on the ground and uh, you might poke it with a rock, you might not, but you can slap a piece of tape over that and still go fly. Easy to patch when you get home, just iron on a new patch of iron on fabric. And some of the fabric out there uh, is actually quite pliable, and you can set it down on rocks and so forth, and it stretches and it makes a dent in it, but then it, it comes back to shape. You take a little heat gun to it, whoop, back to shape, and you're good to go. Much more adaptable to the rough flying environments that we take our hang gliders into uh, than sandwich panel construction. So uh, those are the types of trade-offs that I've had to deal with in getting the aircraft to 100 pounds. Now you go, Raul, how do you know what stuff weighs and what works and what doesn't work um, if nobody's done it before, if there's not a lot of data on it? And the fact of the matter is, for the most part, I don't know, and I have to make samples and test them. But uh, I have the advantage of having done one of these aircraft before. Uh, as you may know, I did the Klingberg wing back in the 80s uh, when a lot of this composite stuff was just still being played with in terms of these types of aircraft, and I had to invent a bunch of stuff then. Uh, and uh, I'm going to bring over here uh, a section, the last section of the wing that I have from that aircraft. And, and uh, that's right here. This is uh, three feet of the right wing tip 
uh, it's the last that I have left. The, the big crunch here, and I think I've shown this in some other videos. Uh, you can see this crunch out at the wingtip here. This is the wingtip that ran into the cliff at Torrey Pines uh, right after that stall spin accident. And uh, this is where it hit and crunched in and, and flipped over and went down the cliff. Uh, but I saved this wingtip for demonstration and analysis purposes, and it gives me a chance to talk about some of the things that I did with that design. Uh, this design had a 40-foot wingspan. It had about 160 square feet of area. Uh, it was a fiberglass uh, uh, carbon fiber composite D-tube uh, with uh, ribs that unfolded, and then it had fabric back here, Dacron covering. Uh, and this aircraft, 40-foot wingspan, weighed 85 pounds. Uh, which I felt was really good. I was shooting for 80, and I hit 85. Uh, so not too bad in terms of aircraft design. Usually you plan on going 10 or 15% over, but I managed to stay well within that. But there were some very unique things I had to do to do this design. And I turn it over so you can see the inside here. And you'll see on the inside, this is just a shell of fiberglass. This is uh, 120 style fiberglass on the outside, three ounces uh, per square yard. Very thin, very lightweight. This uh, outer shell is less than ten thousandths of an inch thick. And it's over a half inch thick layer of one pound per cubic foot bead styrofoam. And if you've ever done aircraft design or know anything about it, uh, your hair's on fire right now. <laughs> You're like, whoa! First of all, it's only got an outer skin. It's not a full sandwich panel. And it's beadboard, which has no structural integrity to it whatsoever. You can push on it from the outside, and it buckles and cracks, and all kinds of horrible things happen. That is true. This is what I did to get the weight down. And uh, along the way, I had to solve some problems. Bead foam sucks up a lot of resin. Uh, that doesn't do you any good in terms of your structural strength. So I had to learn that I had a coat the surface with uh, lightweight microbloom filler and sand that down so I didn't suck up extra resin. And I had to put enough ribs into here to keep it from buckling locally. And the ribs were just styrofoam. And sometimes people would see the ribs and go, the ribs are just foam. And I go, yeah, that's good enough. Uh, they'll carry the loads. If the rib fails, it's probably because the D-tube's already buckled and then you've got bigger problems on your hands than the rib failing. Um, but... This was the ultimate in a flying eggshell. There were only four or five spots on this aircraft where you could literally pick it up and carry it. And people, we had to keep people away from the aircraft. Do not touch it, stand back. Uh, do not tap on the wing, do not play with it because one little crunch and you crack this foam and I'd have to be cutting a panel out and going in and repairing it and gluing it back in again. Very high maintenance, very picky on the handling. But I met the weight, and I met the structural requirements of it. And as far as structure is concerned, plenty strong enough to handle all of the aerodynamic loads that are placed on it. It was just a handling nightmare, really. Now, you also notice that the D-tube is asymmetrical. There's 5.6 ounce carbon fiber on the outside. There's unidirectional carbon fiber here for cap strips. And this fiberglass wraps around and hooks into the shear web back here. So the shear web is literally 10 thousandths of an inch, maybe 12 thousandths of an inch thick carbon fiber, one sheet, flat panel. That's the entire shear web. As long as it doesn't buckle, it can carry tremendous loads. So the trick is getting it to not buckle in as light a weight way as possible. So that involved using uh, styrofoam on the inside. Uh, and you'll see that there's no full panel on the inside here. There's, there's some uh, double panel on the inside here in high stress areas. But most of the shear web on the inside was just bare foam. Uh, I had fiberglass top and bottom. There's uh, balsa and spruce caps here underneath the carbon fiber cap strip to prevent local buckling. Uh, and it's it graded where it's higher density out here towards the outer edge and lighter as you go in. And there were verticals occasionally. You can't see it behind where this one rib was, but there's a spruce vertical in here that prevents it from crushing this way. Uh, a gazillion fiddly little pieces all glued together. But it was a really lightweight structure, labor intensive to build, mega hours to put it all together. Uh, like building an old Willow's kit out of all those little balsa sticks. Um, but it's how I could hit the weight. So 
interesting concepts. At the time that I did this, and people saw that I was doing a single shell of composite over hollow styrofoam that's not even meant for aircraft, uh, there were a lot of people shaking their heads going, I don't know. But I knew it would work. And why did I know it would work? Well, I tested it. I built a seven-foot section of the wing using these structural concepts and actually loaded it up and, and saw where it might be flexing too much or beginning to buckle and then changing the design a little bit there to beef it up a little bit. So basically, cut and try engineering. Uh, basic engineering up front to see if it'll take the loads and then cut and try uh, to beef it up where necessary. So all of these lessons that I learned from my original design, I'm able to leverage those concepts, ideas, and knowledge that I have on how these materials behave and apply them to my new design so that I can make a step forward and do new work with a fair amount of confidence of what will work and what won't work based on what I learned from my first wing. So uh, in case some of you weren't aware uh, about these harebrained ideas that I have for how to structurally build this thing, well, there's some foundation uh, in actual experience in how to make it work. I can't say this is the best answer. This aircraft was built to break the world's distance record. We never got that far. Uh, but it was really meant for one purpose, one flight, and it wasn't really meant for commercial usage and high durability. So there were a lot of knobs that I can turn in terms of design that would allow me to hit weights and uh, performance characteristics uh, that create an aircraft that was usable, flyable, but not really a sport aircraft that you could take out every, wing, every weekend and fly. Um, and... It had strange drivers on the weight also. And the drivers of the weight of my original wing are not the drivers of the weight on my new wing, surprisingly enough. Surprised me. I, I was focused on the same uh, items. Oh, I know this is going to be heavy and that's going to be heavy and i got to be careful with this. And it turned out not to be the case with my new wing. Uh, and one of those items like ribs. Here's the inside of a rib for my original wing. You can see they fold it out like this, and they're composite, and they have a sleeve of Dacron over them with Velcro, and the fabric over the wing was attached with a Velcro. It's a high tensile strength Velcro. But this is the inside of that rib. This is blue Dow styrofoam on the inside, and I would do a large half-inch thick sheet of that, and I would sheet it uh, much like you would a model aircraft with balsa on both sides, one 32nd inch thick balsa. And then, using templates, I would cut the rib, rib shape out of that sheet so that the balsa that was on the sides would hold the shape of the rib well enough so that I could put a balsa cap on it. And I'd put a balsa cap here and a balsa cap here. And then I'd round off the corners a little bit. So then I'd have a curved rib shape like this that was strong enough that I could work with and very light, extremely light. Um, and I stole this concept out of indoor model airplane work. I used to fly rubber band powered indoor models and this is kind of how the ribs are cut. They're done differently but the concept is somewhat similar. So I lifted stuff from the model airplane world and brought it into full-size aircraft. Then once I had the rib shape I applied unidirectional carbon fiber to the top of the rib, this part right here, and inside here. So basically what I made was a curved uh, tube of composites where the foam core Turns out to be the foam and balsa core is just a mold that stays in place, that doesn't get removed. The real strength is in this tube of fiberglass and carbon fiber. And then I did a spiral wrap of fiberglass around the outside. At the time, I couldn't get a hold of three ounce, uh, three ounce per square yard weight uh, fiberglass uh, tape uh, to wrap this in. So this was done in like six ounce. And it's way too heavy, way too strong, especially out at the tips. But... I never had one of these ribs fail. These ribs were really strong. These ribs carried all the loads from the Elevon and so forth. Um, and they were fairly straightforward to make. Uh, but here's the kicker. Um, they met the weight to, uh, straight, uh, strength to weight ratio. This rib manufacturing process was the 13th one I went through. 13 of them. I spent months making and testing different ways of making these ribs to get the right weight, uh, strength to weight ratio. Because I had found out that the major, one of the major drivers of the weight of my first wing was the ribs. These ribs weigh pounds and pounds and pounds. 
And I had to find a way to get them lighter. And I went through all these, I went through designs that were lightweight enough, but just too hard to make them. And then I went through ones that are really easy to make, but just way too heavy. And it was a nasty design corner, and I was stuck in it for three or four months until I came up with this idea. And I came up with it through cut and try. Um, and there's a lot of that on my new glider. So very unconventional method for making a rib, but it answered the problem, and you end up with a structurally sound and appropriate aircraft component this way, and making a rib that, in a way that nobody else would make it. And by the way, all the ribs were like this. They had no vertical bracing in them, no diagonal bracing. They were just an upper and a lower. And some of the ribs were really long, like close to five feet long, and they worked fine that way. They didn't need any vertical bracing in them. Uh, so that was another shocking concept that people would see. It's like, wow, isn't that rib going to buckle? I go, no, I've tested it. I've built them. I've put loads on them. Uh, and they're Velcroed to the skin so they can't go side to side. They carry the loads. I know they carry the loads because I've tested them. And that's really the key to all of this stuff. As I walk into areas where people haven't been before or I can't find data on, I literally have to spend the time of making a boatload of samples and testing them and figuring out what will work and what won't work. So.